Now, how do you administer insulin? You give, you give IV insulin, and IV insulin, actually, let's do it this way, IV. First, you take 0 0.1 units per kilogram, 0 0.1 unit per kilogram in the, as a bolus. So for a 70 kilogram person, this will be seven units that you infuse as a bolus um, administration. There is just one thing here. There is something that might stop you from giving insulin. There may be a decision here that, hey man, don't give insulin. You're gonna kill the patient by giving insulin. What is that? Potassium levels. Why? What are the things that move potassium into the cell? One major thing is insulin. How does it do it? When it drives the glucose in the cell, that glucose going in the cell will be converted to ATP, which will cause sodium potassium pumps to run that will move potassium in. Can I say that anything that causes sodium potassium pumps to run can cause hypovolemia if it is not present in proper homeostatic balance? That's a cofactor. It doesn't drive the pump. Magnesium was the answer from there. Magnesium is a cofactor for potassium movement. So imagine you have hyperkalemia. Okay. So what else runs these pumps fast? What else stimulates ATP pumps? Oxygen. Hmm. If you give more oxygen, you run these faster? No. So oxygen was the answer. Uh, probably that is not the best answer. What else? Thyroid hormone. Thyroid drives them fast. What else? Sympathetic stimulation drives them fast. Right? So there are, there are other factors as well. At this time, we are interested in insulin over here. When you give insulin, insulin is going to cause a hypokalemia. Or, let me say this, not cause hypokalemia, it will reduce potassium levels. If the patient is at risk of hypokalemia, then that can happen and that can cause cardiac arrhythmias. So that means before you hang up insulin, so the patient is here, what have you done so far? You put one liter of normal saline. Now you're getting ready to put insulin. I remember somebody told me that, hey, as soon as the patient comes in, we give them glucose and we give them insulin and they are on their way. No, they might actually be on some other way. You don't do that. First you see what are the labs and the labs are going to tell you what is the potassium level. And if the potassium level is lesser than 3.3 milli equivalents per liter, then you don't give insulin. So what is the principle of therapy here? Keep the potassium level at about 4 milli equivalents per liter. Keep the potassium level somewhere about 4. If you keep it between 4 to 5, that is fine. But if it goes down, then you have to give potassium to fix it. So if the potassium level is lesser than 3.3 milli equivalents, then do not start insulin and first correct the potassium. First you give potassium. So 20 to 40 milli equivalents of potassium per hour and maybe give it once and see what is the result of that. If the potassium levels come in four range, then you can start insulin. So guys, please remember one thing. The only thing you are going to need to prevent as a DKA, DKA managers, as doctors, 
is prevent cardiac issues, cardiac arrhythmias because of potassium, hypokalemia, and prevent cerebral edema. Kidney would do the rest. If you cannot just remember these two things, then, then you are going to have a problem. Right, so here you are looking at what? You are protecting the heart. From what? From arrhythmias due to hypokalemia. So in this situation, don't give insulin because insulin is going to do what? Aggravate the hypokalemia. It can cause arrhythmia and even cardiac arrest, killing the patient. Done? If the potassium level is up to, you know, greater than 3.3 milli equivalent to 5, then you can administer 10 to 20 milli equivalents per liter of potassium. You can administer this much potassium with insulin. So you start insulin and also add potassium because insulin is going to move potassium into the cells. So you just start giving exogenous potassium. Again, what is the principle here? Keep potassium levels at about 4 level. Keep them between 4 to 5 is fine. If patient is there with hyperkalemia, potassium greater than 5.1 milli equivalent per liter, then don't give potassium. Patient already has ample potassium that as insulin moves potassium into the cells, the potassium levels will drop and still stay in the safe zone. Just keep monitoring. So can I ask you one more thing? Can you manage DKA without monitoring? Can you have a table First hour, one liter plus this much potassium plus this much insulin, start. Second hour, half liter, this much insulin, this much potassium, start. Would you, can you do that? No. You do not know the volume levels. You do not know the potassium level. This patient can come in with hyperkalemia or normal potassium or hypokalemia. So without measuring, you cannot touch this patient. Okay, back to insulin. So decision making, this is the thing that can stop insulin administration, right? Let's say that is not the situation you have this. Now you know that here no potassium administered, here administer 10 to 20, here first administer 20 to 40 milli equivalents per liter and then when the levels are between 4 to 5 then you start insulin or even if the level reaches about 4 greater than 3.3 you start coming into the safe zone insulin bolus you gave 0.1 micro uh, sorry units per kilogram first hour within not first hour within 5 to 10 minutes Then you start infusion of same 0.1 unit per kilogram IV. Now, what are you going to check with this? What are the labs that are going to be important to understand if this is working okay or not? Two labs. Sugar level and sugar level and <coughs> potassium. Guys, potassium. We just talked about it. Potassium. You are just please. Uh, anytime I ask you what are you going to monitor, tell me potassium. You won't go wrong. What are you going to monitor? Potassium. What are you going to monitor? Potassium. Second thing, if I say something more, osmolality. If you can do this much, I'm good. You'll fix the patient. So here, you're looking for glucose levels. 
and you're looking for potassium. Now, what glucose levels? What should be the situation with the glucose levels? Let's say this patient has 400, let's say given is 400 milligram per deciliter was the glucose level in this patient. That is where we started with. Not too much, not too bad. What is the osmotic contribution? 400 divided by 20 or 20. So if the patient has 140 sodium, 140 plus 20 is about three, 280 plus 20, three, uh, 300, not too bad. It's not too bad. It is almost in the normal ranges. It is in the normal ranges. So here, when you start giving insulin and you're measuring potassium, sorry, glucose, what do you intend there? What is your princi principle of therapy there? Glucose will drop for two reasons. What are the two reasons? Insulin is one. Second. No, no, no. Of course, that would be one part. But you had said, said something. Say it again. Fluids. So as you give fluids, you expand the volume, glucose will become relatively diluted. So osmolality would drop. Right, so osmolality, you're checking, you're checking the glucose levels. How much glucose level should you drop per hour? So back up for a second, dropping glucose fast has a problem. What is that? Whenever I say just, what are the complications you're taking care of? That's your answer, right? What are you monitoring? Potassium. Who are you helping? Kidney. That's it. That, that is DK management. Right? It is actually very easy management. Keep kidneys working. Keep cerebral edema. Prevent that. And prevent cardiac arrhythmias by potassium. Done. Okay. So here you are monitoring glucose. What levels you should not exceed per hour? What drop level? 50 to 75 milligram per deciliter. Now, there are some books that say 75 to 100 milligram per deciliter. I believe that American Diabetes Association says 75 to 100. So confirm it. Sissel says 50 to 75. So just see what is your book that you like or what is a book that you are practicing with. Use that. But do not drop it anywhere faster than 100 milligram. How, what does that mean? Look. Patient came in, 400 milligram, you hung up the IV, you gave insulin, uh, insulin, and let's say, I'm making up a number, let's say in half an hour you tested the patient again. Although you test patient's labs in one hour and then two hours, but let's say here you're testing the patient within half an hour. You're curious for what is happening. And the result that you see is that the glucose level has gone from 400 to 300. Should you be all happy that, yay, glucose is going down fast, I'm very happy. What happened? So you are reducing the osmolality very fast, you don't want that. So what do you do? Stop insulin right away. This is more insulin. If half an hour, 100 milligram per de deciliter is gone, that means you're dropping it by 200 milligram per deciliter for an hour. You don't want that. On the other hand, if after half an hour, patient has about 30 milligram per deciliter dropped. Are you comfortable? Yes. So adjust the insulin according to the levels of drop that you need, normally between 50 to 75 or 75 to 100 milligram per deciliter per hour. Per hour. Don't drop it more than that. And it is dropping for two reasons, expansion and insulin. Good. Once you have reached somewhere about 200-ish, 250-ish, you can then half this insulin and you can actually go to 
0 0.02 to 0 0.05 unit per kilogram <coughs> IV. Good. If the patient, so now hear this out. Is this clear? Who can repeat this one? Insulin administration. Should you do insulin? Should you give it insulin or not? Administer insulin or not? Who is going to tell you that? Potassium levels. If potassium levels are lesser than? Then do not give insulin. Do what? 20 to 40 milli equivalent potassium. Correct the potassium and bring it between 4 to 5. Then go back to insulin. Don't mess up this step. There's only one step you need to do. Potassium, potassium, potassium. When you get out of this room, what should be written on your head automatically? Potassium. Right, so that is what you need to do. So once you know that potassium is in the correct range, then you start stat bolus administration of? In 70 kg guy, seven units. Then you start an IV infusion five to 10 minutes later. Yes, you can actually do this. Now I'm gonna confuse you a little bit. You can actually forget the bolus, double this dose and put IV. But ADA's recommendation is to give the bolus and then do this. Good? You keep monitoring what? What? With insulin, glucose levels and Potassium, you always say potassium whenever I say what do you monitor. So you to monitor potassium and glucose and once you have the glucose levels dropping, you don't want them to drop faster than 50 to 75 milligram per deciliter per hour. So bring that patient to the maintenance dose. If you are giving subcutaneous insulin, subcutaneous, which can happen one, when patient has uncomplicated DKA. Uncomplicated DKA means what? Patient doesn't have severe hypovolemia. Patient doesn't have severe hypokalemia. Bicarb levels are not too down. So patient is rather stable. So when you have uncomplicated DKA, then you can actually give subcutaneous insulin as well, which can be, you start with, so for subcutaneous, you start with 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 units per kilogram subcutaneous. Then you drop it down after an hour, so this is the stat, then 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 unit per kilogram subcutaneous. <coughs> Again, what do you monitor? Potassium. Potassium and glucose. Right? From glucose, what do you see? It's not just that, hey, glucose is going down, it should not go more than 75. You're also monitoring, you're also doing math of osmolality. Osmolality tells you cerebral edema. And this number is, this number is such that this is the number where least amount of cerebral edema has occurred. They have adjusted these numbers according to that. So yes, you can trust it, but whenever you see the labs, do your own math. Take sodium levels, multiply them by 2, add glucose divided by 20 or 18. Good? So you're looking at these things. Insulin done, any problems with this? Insulin is going to do what? That is a primary need. 